Greetings, everyone. This is Ayman Tarabishi, President and CEO of the International Council for Small Business. I'm also Deputy Chair of the Department of Management at the George Washington University. I am excited to, to, to bring back Dr. Nasru Taura, Senior Lecturer at Bournemouth University in the UK. And over the summer, we started this, um, what we call a pilot, kind of talking about the topic of digital entrepreneurship. But our intentions, and we knew it would be something that a lot of, people, a lot of our members and, and, and ICSB colleagues from around the world will be interested in, is this topic of digital entrepreneurship. And, and, and we were just delighted to say, as we put together our program from September to December, uh, Dr. Nasser and I talked about a series and a sequence of webinars and articles that will complement each webinar here. So and as soon as we finish this webinar, we'll soon in the next couple of days, we'll launch his first post that he did for us for ICSB, and then we'll follow up with subsequent posts and, and webinars here. So as, as you see, this becomes a sequence of sorts on the topic of digital entrepreneurship. Saying this, I am delighted to have you all join us here. I hope you all, our family are safe and, and doing well and prospering here. But more importantly, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Nasru for his time, dedication, and support to ICSB. Dr. Nasru, um, the topic itself is exciting, emerging digital cluster spaces and well-being. It, 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 this is all sounds very relevant today. So with, with that, I leave you the floor and I wanna thank you and welcome again for our session here. Let's, let's welcome Dr. Nasser all together. Thank you. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, hello, Ayman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. I'm absolutely delighted. Um, anything digital, entrepreneurship, innovation, design really excites me. And there couldn't be a better time to be discussing digital entrepreneurship than now. Um, um, but I start by um, sending my greetings and regards to everyone um, joining us from around the world. Uh, just before we start, um, Ayman was telling me the number of people joining from different parts of the world. So, so you're all very welcome. And I do hope that in the course of our discussion, you would find some interesting things. Uh, and then perhaps maybe we could take it from there. As Ayman says, this, um, you know, is becoming, is likely going to be a series. So um, you're welcome again. Like I said, there couldn't be a better time to be discussing digital entrepreneurship than today. And just simply because uh, we are experiencing, um, you know, one of the most uh, cataclysmic event um, that happened in terms of uh, the coronavirus or COVID-19 um, that had shaken the very foundation of the world economy, but also in particular, what we're seeing is that the uh, entire digital ecosystem, uh, there is some kind of reconfiguration going on in terms of uh, what we seem to um, know about what digital ecosystem or tech ecosystem um, is. So um, just to set the context for my presentation today, um, I would like to say that in terms of the context, um, there are certain trends that we are seeing. For example, there are a lot of new players um, that are coming into this digital space and this might not be what typically you would consider to be digital entrepreneurs, but I think they are coming with an agenda, with a very possible, um, you know, ways of doing things that they cannot be ignored. And not just the new entrants, we're also seeing that as for the incumbents, the existing digital businesses, uh, there are coming up with some new, more collaborative ways of um, value co-creation and, you know, so many ways of doing things as we are realizing that we all cannot go it alone. We need each other, you know, if we are to survive, you, you know, all, all the issues happening around us. And if nothing also, the issue with the COVID-19 reminds us how limited we are in terms of our foresight and also therefore calls for the need to invest more research and also more resources in post-site kind of research and post-site agenda uh, generally. So I think in terms of the context, this is all, you know, um, these are the things happening, but together all this meant that it has plunged us into a state of liminality and liminal spaces or state, essentially what it is, is that a state whereby you left what you're very comfortable with, that is your former um, you know, environment that you're really comfortable with, and then you are transitioning into 
an uncharted terrain. Uh, and, and in this case, transition from where we used to be and, and, and to the digital. Now, in between that transition, that state of in-betweenness is normally referred to as uh, a liminal space. Now, within that liminal space, you find the digital entrepreneurs and um, the governments from around the world and also, uh, you know, practitioners, educators, and also just some curious bystanders, all in a state of confusion. But within that state of confusion also uh, arise, you know, new possibilities, new ways of doing things. And as a result, this is, you know, um, defines the context upon which this presentation is going to be built upon. So as a result, therefore, the main key topics or issues that I'm going to be discussing will be around some of this imagine trends and in particular I focus more on the imagine digital clusters that are quite unusual from what used to be the normal traditional clusters but also spaces I'm really interested in space space research and and, and the practicalities there are quite enormous but also very importantly the issue of well-being it all gets fascinating people talk about digital and application and what we can do with the digital but in most instances tend to forget the soft side what i would call for example the the, the well-being of the digital entrepreneurs themselves because that is crucially important we want digital entrepreneurs but we all want them um healthy and in a best state of mind as well so this is about the context and the structure that i'm going to be covering today. So I therefore start by, you know, saying that I think, you know, what COVID-19 does to us all is that it has forced us into um, a striking technology adoption for people who might not be, for example, digitally savvy. Um, they've had to find ways of adopting new technologies. We just respect to university now and there are so many tools that we have had to learn um, during the lockdown so that to, to make the teaching exciting and also many digital entrepreneurs have to find ways of doing things. But also it accelerated digital transformations for those companies that already have some kind of digital presence or digital content, they've had to you know, invest in, in more accelerated kind of transformations. Some already existing digital businesses have had to re-innovate or rather innovate more frequently than, 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 than they used to, you know. But also, you know, like I said, the whole reconfiguration of the entire digital ecosystem, you, you, you know, is something worth reflecting about. So this is what happened. Um, but now I, I come across, um, during the lockdown, I come across this um, article that was shared in the World Economic Forum with, with the heading that you just see on the screen here. Lockdown is the world's biggest psychological experiment and will pay the price. And it couldn't get out of my head. Uh, it keeps free echoing. And I said, yes, we're going to be paying a price, but what role can I play as an educator and also as a social platform innovator? What role can I play to ensure that in small ways I played a role in making sure that we played, um, you know, less price than, you know, anticipated. So therefore, it, it, it meant that now we're moving into this future, this uncharted terrain, but what that research, you know, find, what it discusses is the fact that there are a lot of people that will be coming out of the lockdown uh, with a lot of um, in emotional instabilities and, you know, it has affected us in all different ways and also the, the, the mental well-being um, is likely going to be affected poorly. So we are going into the digital future, but we are going with, if you like, some emotional baggage and this balance and reconciliation needs to be taken very seriously. Now, to even make this more relevant in terms of this discussion, you know, again, I, because once in a while I do check the reports about global risk report and the recent, most, um, the most recent report 
actually, you know, discusses some of the very important things that we all have to take very seriously, whether you are a digital entrepreneur or not, issues such as uh, climate action failure, biodiversity loss, food crisis, extreme weather, human made environmental disasters, you, you name it. Now, if you look at the you know, the, the image, um, you know, by the left. And if you like, you can go and have a look at the report to see more details. That is on one hand. On the other hand, there is another report here in the UK prior to the COVID-19 that was published. And this agency is called We Are 360. Um, we Are 360. And they published this report, which is quite very relevant, a little scary, uh, but all the more useful, saying that nine in 10 entrepreneurs report signs of mental health strain and 77% of the founders say running a business has affected their mental health. 71% said that it has affected their physical health and over half identified with the complete burnout. Now, this was prior to COVID-19 and post COVID-19, I, like I, we've shown earlier, it's even going to get you know more and i imagine for digital entrepreneurs especially you know the anxiety you know is likely going to be more because you, you are constantly trying to keep up with the next technology and how you going to adopt it previously we were talking about industry 4.0 and now we're talking about 5.0 so you know it's so very important that we sit down and discuss this which is what we're doing now but also i identified there is a big disconnect. Now we have these digital entrepreneurs whom we want, whom we trusted to be coming up with solutions, you know, digital solutions to deal with climate action failure, biodiversity, food crisis of the future. But the issue is that they are experiencing uh, mental health strain. So I think the main disconnect has to do with you know, spaces, the spaces that we provide that can nourish and support their creative soul and then creative energy as well. So, which is why my main research, you know, and practice also as an entrepreneur, you know, uh, is, is around um, one of my main research about digital entrepreneurial cluster space and well being. And also, I tried to locate my research within the compass of, uh, if you like, entrepreneurship, innovation, and design. So it's not just about the digital solutions and digital products, but also the atmosphere, you know, that supports that. One of our research, which I will talk about later, you know, finds that, um, you know, in a more favorable environment, and I would tell you what, what I mean by that, you know, the digital entrepreneurs are more likely to innovate more frequently. Okay, and you know, as I tried to go through this presentation, because I wear multiple hats, of course, I'm originally from um, from Nigeria. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Jigawa State in Nigeria, and that I now lived in United Kingdom and having you know gone around the world. So I'll be citing some of my experience and some of examples from my research, you know, to 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 make a point. So like I said, I think a fundamentally important is how we define what space is, the space upon which we develop the innovative solutions. For some, space will just simply be, you know, uh, the, the galaxy or, or, or the sky. For others, it would be, you know, the space, you know, a contemplative state, uh, space of um, imagining, oh, perhaps it could be, you know, what the environmental psychologists, you know, could refer to as, you know, attention restorative spaces, because it seems like the digital entrepreneurs, because of the information overload, are more likely to need a lot more of this attention restorative spaces, because a, the attentions are constantly being distracted and then the judgment are not as effective as going to be then that then is an issue. So the, the question of how space contributes to the digital solutions that you know we need um, you know in the world now it depends on how someone defines what space is for you know it depends if space is expanding is contracting you know whatever that is, it's likely going to determine how you, 
you know, come up with solutions within what that space is. For us, digitalization meant that the role of geography and space becomes less. I don't subscribe to that, and I would explain that as uh, a bit later. I really don't subscribe to that. I, d I do think actually, if nothing, um, you, you know, in, in certain instances, spaces and the role of economic geography become even more relevant. Okay, so some of the trends that I talked about that are happening in my previous presentation that I haven't talked about, I we find out in a research that we conducted, you know, in the seaside town of Bournemouth and Poole here in the United Kingdom, there is a tendency now that, you know, I, I, I don't want to say this, but let me say it because it seems to me that our old, um, the model of, um, I know we have a lot of colleagues from the United States, um, like the Silicon Valley styled cluster um, had been so successful over the years. I think it will continue to be successful, but now we are beginning to see an emergence of an alternate form of strain. And this is um, giving rise to the possibility of gig economy and also what is called the peripheral entrepreneurship. So if digital entrepreneurs could be anywhere and try to create value. So it doesn't really matter. It's on tech ecosystem, digital entrepreneurship, um, you know, clustering tend to be around the urban cities and that are past phased and, 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 and with all that, that comes along with it. But I think now, you know, what we see in is we've seen a lot of uh, returnee uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the rise of being more conscious about work-life balance, lifestyle entrepreneurship, and therefore because the digital you know, is making that possible, we're going to see certain kind of clusters imagine, you know, in the periphery rather than in the center. And that really fascinates me. It's one of the studies I conducted and now we are rolling that out to see how many others we, you know, have and, you know, what would be the examples of good practice. Now, another thing that is quite a very fascinating trend that is happening in the world of digital entrepreneurship today is worth considering. I don't know, uh, in the midst, there might be some digital entrepreneurs, some are educators, but if you are a digital entrepreneur, I think something to also consider, to think about is uh, the rise of what we call the um, peripheral, uh, the rise of what is called the astrofreneurship or spastic uh, entrepreneurs and also they do emerge also in clusters and the reason being that there are a lot of people who if you ask them they don't think of themselves as astropreneurs or maybe space entrepreneurs or space tech entrepreneurs but also you know it's worth considering if for example your your business predominantly uses kind of satellite data space technology navigation systems, earth observations to create value to your customers uh, downstream or, or here on, on the planet earth. So the extent to which we, you use that could also redefine. And now very interestingly, what is happening is that, and I think this is likely going to happen more in the future, we're going to see a lot more people defining themselves or classifying themselves in the world of digital entrepreneurship as space tech entrepreneurs or space entrepreneurial um, clusters. And to give you a, a, a current example, like if you think about in terms of the COVID-19 issue now happening around the world, the issue of um, um, track and trace had become very relevant and that wouldn't have been possible without uh, the satellite data you know, earth observation tools that are available to us. I, I have a friend um, here in the UK, uh, George, who is doing some wonderful work around the issue of um, geolocation intelligence. And I think we're going to see a lot more judges kind of in the future. So this is fantastic. So now here in the UK, and I'm going to talk about other places as well. Uh, the UK had realized, the United Kingdom had realized how important this is and therefore had created a number of um, partnership arrangements between the UK Space Agency and so many um, regional 
um, centers and universities in the United Kingdom. And the program was called Set Squared, whereby digital entrepreneurs are being enrolled and being shown how to use space tech as being an integrated part of the digital solutions that they offer. Now, this is crucially important. Like I said, if you think about it, it's no longer going to be in the future like you're just digital entrepreneur who created a digital solution without connecting to the issues that we're facing today, like the environmental issues, climatic issues, and, and all that. So therefore, it's, it's, it's crucial that we understand this segment, and this is now changing the, the digital ecosystem, and I think it's a fascinating opportunity. So most of the time when I talk about space tech opportunities, people think about the Elon Musk's of this world and, you know, and, and, and they think of, you know, a very um, a capital intensive kind of project, but it's not necessarily the case that I think is space for everyone. And someone said to me, actually, we haven't exhausted the entrepreneurial opportunities in our planet Earth, but you're talking about digital um, entrepreneurial opportunities in the space, uh, especially in African context. And now this takes me to Africa, and you'll be surprised, uh, or perhaps not, to say that some of these sophisticated technologies that we, we, we talk about, very advanced technologies, artificial intelligence, drone robotics, you know, are found in new spaces of implementation in Africa. And all this is being aided by specific opportunities that arises there. So who would have known that, for example, Rwanda would be one of the first countries to test run, you know, using drone to airlift humanitarian logistics, or perhaps maybe a Cameroonian startup using AI, you know, to diagnose plant and diseases, you know, helping with food crisis or maybe using AI satellites to, to help, you know, uh, with, with, with sustainable forestry, all this is taking place in Africa. So space tech is crucial to, to all parts of the world and that includes Africa. And now, um, interestingly, again, because I'm talking about Africa before moving, so there is a trend that is now happening in Africa, which they call the digital leapfrogging. Now, it is becoming more familiar now. Um, Africa is now poised to be a very significant player in the global uh, tech scene. However, you know, there are many parts of rural Africa that were completely disconnected from development in the past. Um, and, but, you know, they couldn't have access or mobility tele fixed telephone systems. But with the coming of mobile systems, you know, people in rural Africa, women, people who have been marginalized have all now been included, you know, which is quite brilliant. And then now comes another revolution whereby, you know, Africa, because it's quite expensive to invest in the transport infrastructure and therefore Africa leapfrog again and now it's using uh, drones to, to do all sort of things movies and so many things uh, like that and humanitarian logistics but but that is not enough now also there is another trend that has been predicted recently which um, quite fascinated uh, to see how that goes whereby because Africa has one of the lowest motorization levels um, in the world together because um, if you look at the statistics there are about 100 million new cars that have been sold globally uh, of which if you're talking about the new cars, only 1 million cars being sold in Africa. So in terms of automotive new digital segment, the electronic cars, Africa is not mostly on the radar, but many are now predicting that actually if Africa were to leapfrog again, you know, um, many would have, you know, the electronic solar cars or driverless cars, you know, as the first cars, um, you know, without having to, you know, experience, you know, having the manual and, and all those uh, kind of things. So, however, you know, it's interesting here, I think both the global North and South to understand what is happening in Africa is, is absolutely crucial. So in terms of modes of innovation, generally, you know, the two modes of innovation that research shows, um, science, technology, a kind of mode of innovation and also there is what is called doing, using and interacting mode of innovation. So the more advanced countries in the world are very good at um, the, you know, investment in science and technology is quite very rife and um, it's interesting. 
but because we have these advanced technologies and they're not being fully implemented here and a lot are finding ways to be implemented in Africa and this is going to happen more and more. So the two need to feed each other because like any other software or new technology, you know, you learn more by using it. So if all this um, advanced technologies that we're talking about, artificial intelligence and, you know, whatnot, 3D printing, have found a way to be implemented. It means that the people implementing them are more likely going to be developing some learning, you know, of using them. And if there is no close coordination between global north and south, then there would be a disconnect because that learning needs to be paid back into um, the you know, research intensive centers that, 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 that we have. So, so, and that would then be, it worked for, for Africa. But also I would talk about this later, uh, last time. Is it a good thing for Africa to just be leapfrogging all the time? Is it conscious? Is it, you know, talking about conscious entrepreneurialism? Uh, are they conscious? Is there a planned way in which this could become capability for the continent? And as a result, this is where I came in as a digital um, platform into free you know, I try to connect between the global north and south and try to find opportunities through a platform I co-founded that's called the Pan-African Innovation and Cluster Academy. So now the last part of the development, um, which is in place, which I think is helping in the reconfiguration of the tech ecosystem is the rise in attention, um, restorative or space uh, clusters as it were. So I have about three students who, you know, have completed their dissertations on space entrepreneurship, but we, we would link to uh, being digital. And that fascinates me even the more. Like I have some students who developed uh, ways in which disconnected spaces are going to be affecting who are experimenting with like co-working space and healthy eating kind of spaces. I have another recent student who completed a dissertation about, you know, how to create a more relaxed atmosphere. That is where I, I teach in Bournemouth, you know, where like the digital entrepreneurs and pandas would be meeting the more relaxed kind of cafe style, pitch their ideas without all the intimidation that, that comes along with it. So I think we're going to see a lot more in terms of the rise of contemplative imaginative spaces, therapeutic spaces, and what I call the slow spaces. You know, we, we need it, you know, to nourish our soul. Sometimes you don't need the past phase, you need the slow. Sometimes what you need, you know, entrepreneurial journey is not the easiest, of journey because you are likely going to experience failure, but it's the extent to which you create a space that enables you to, to be a therapeutic space sort of to enable you recover or contemplate and imagine, you know, what, what, what does it mean uh, to you during the lockdown? People had engaged in a lot of contemplative imagination because, you know, there was no way kind of to go, so such kind of uh, spaces. So I finally think it's important to say that, you know, I'm not just, you know, I, I've just identified all of this that are changing the digital ecosystem, but I happen to be really lucky in the sense that where I work in Bournemouth uh, and Poole region, which is southwest of England, there is an imagine cluster that actually I think is, is an example of good practice. Because the last time we conducted a study, we find what fascinated us is that this region is growing faster than London, you know, and, and a tech cluster growing faster than London, you can imagine that. And also not only growing faster, we find that the digital enterprises uh, in the Bournemouth and Poole region tend to innovate more frequently. So what could possibly be the reason? First, you know, I think it's the space, the atmosphere, the contemplative spaces, the relaxed atmosphere that nourishes the cell, which is why I said, I think the Silicon Valley styled kind of um, a cluster, I think we've seen some alternate forms that emerges here in some really nice relaxed atmosphere. Our generation are more um, conscious, I think, in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of 
consciousness going on in terms of consumption, conscious consumption, conscious everything, conscious of environment. So we're going to see a lot of digital entrepreneurs or digital nomads, as they're called, going around, you know, places, beautiful places to do business. So here in Bournemouth and Poop, not only do we have that, there is also an Imagine Aerospace Maintenance Repair Cluster, and also there is Agritech and Sustainable kind of cluster, but also very importantly, there is a Financial Service Cluster. Now to put this to context, historically in the United Kingdom, most of this kind of seaside towns, what tend to happen is that they fully rely on tourism. As, as a source of income for regenerative activities. But now this is changing because for those that relied only on that as a single or mono identity, um, it's more likely to be unsustainable, but for places like Bournemouth and Poole that embrace this multiple identity, you know, embrace also the power of digitalization, you know, are making the most of this. Okay, and this is an example. So what we see in now is we see in all this reverse migration, returning digital entrepreneurs, graduate retention, you know, in, in the area from my university and another university in the region. So all this is fascinating. So, but I say, like, what is very important and what is the main point to take here is that the critical well-being infrastructure, like I said, we need digital entrepreneurs, but we need them healthy. If we can provide and replicate more of this kind of spaces, then that would absolutely be brilliant for everyone, including the digital entrepreneurs. So finally, I would now I just say that, you know, some of the tech home ideas here is that we want digital entrepreneurs, but we want them to be healthy. Uh, critical well-being infrastructure is crucial. I uh, you know that protection policies but I think that we need to do a lot more also in establishing critical well-being infrastructure. I repeat again, critical well-being infrastructure because the entrepreneur behind the digital is so important and their well-being is equally as important, if not more important than the digital solutions uh, that they come up with. So spaces are crucial enablers for developing the sustainable sections, which also aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So, you know, the, the, the shifts, the rises of these three imagined digital places. Normally I said reverse migration, I think is crucially important. It hasn't been noticed in places, but I think it's slowly taking place. It's important. Uh, attention, restorative spaces, another very important thing to uh, integrate into our understanding and also the space tech. I think a lot more entrepreneurs are space tech entrepreneurs without knowing, but even though if they don't want to identify as such, I would encourage try to use more in that. And for countries in other developing countries that haven't invested in the spaces thinking that, you know, they don't need it, I think they should reconsider. And finally, and this is for Africa. I think digital leapfrogging is good, but I would encourage all the African countries or entrepreneurs engaging in this digital leapfrog to, because this is more like, I wouldn't say it's quintessentially only African phenomena, but it's happening more in Africa than in other regions. And it's good for Africa to know, to be conscious about it, but also for other parts of clear agenda about how this capability could be built and be used in the future. Imagine yourself, you've gone in for shopping, you are in a queue and only uh, to say that, okay, let's cut this queue and then th you open up many more other counters and then therefore you find yourself in the beginning. This is literally what must African um, most in Africa are experiencing, especially the marginalized ones in rural places. Suddenly they can go into mobile, they can transact businesses. This was never going to be possible because the infrastructure could just not reach them. So this is changing, but I think it needs to be conscious. And if it is conscious, it would help everyone. And you know, the 13 United Nations Sustainable Goal each digital entrepreneur, I say that we are now living in a conscious world, 
do not just create a digital solution without being conscious about how that helps us at least in you know minimizing one of these global issues that, that that we're facing it could be hunger it could be poverty it could be college education it could be gender it could be anything and that brings the end to my presentation thank you very much for listening this is fantastic hello Ivan. Yes, yes, I can hear you. I, I've been listening here and I've been watching everybody's talking here. So this is really amazing here. Thank you very much here. Um, before I ask the questions, what I'd like to do here is okay. ask everybody that if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the, in the, in the comment section. So, you know, um, you know it's just um, Sam Yogg and, 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 and Richard and everybody, please write your comments or questions here and then We'll, we'll build on it this way. I'm, ch I'm changing a little bit here. Instead of me starting asking him a million questions, I'm going to ask you guys to start asking the questions here, and then we'll build on it here. So, so while, while we're doing this, um, while, we're, while, while they're writing the questions here, right? Yes, let me, yes, I let, me, let me ask you this question. Yeah. Where, where do you think, where do you think now is our biggest opportunity? If you say, I'm in you need to run with this, or you guys need to really focus on this. What might that be? What's that one thing that's like just the low hanging fruit that we have to do? Oh, I, we, go ahead. I, I think it's space, Simon. I go back to this. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, go I ahead. Say, I think one of the areas that is not a traditional yeah, well, one of the areas uh, that are not traditionally identified as um, digital entrepreneurship, so as if you're a digital entrepreneur, I would say is, you know, the space tech. Many people, you know, are a little bit afraid of it because the mere sound of space means that something capital intensive, rocket science that you can, but, you know, with the rise of global value chain, such that increasing modularity, whereby even a mechanical product like a bicycle is produced in multiple countries in the world. It now means that each country, a participant in the global value chain could actually develop some kind of expertise in some, some areas, you know, space and space tech. Because when I talk about space, I don't necessarily mean only just going to space or sending rockets, but, you know, if there are some satellite and observations because that's why here in, in the UK, you know, they really invested in this, which is quite good. You know, this partnership, you know, between the UK Space Agency trying to make it simpler and easy for entrepreneurs to say that, you know, it's not what you think, you know, we can help. There is another agency that's called the Ordnance Survey as well that is having these innovation challenges and saying they will create a problem and then they will say that, you know, use um, earth observation technology to kind of come up with solutions. So you, you don't have to do the programming, for example, but you conceptual innovation is what is required. So I think it's, it's a lot untapped at the moment and it's a lot more, it's doable than people think. Hello? Yeah, I'm muted here. Uh, but Ivan, okay. are you there? Yeah, I, I, I hear yeah. you. I hear you very well here. You know, oh, okay. um, the, uh, Richard talks about the Francophone, the Francophone issue. Okay. Okay. Um, and yeah. talks about Africa. Where does mm -hmm. Africa fit into this, all of this? And I mentioned earlier in one of my posts that Africa is maybe, you know, maybe it was slow or, it, you know, it, it jumped a couple of generations because it didn't yeah. have to go through this curve right it's yeah. just jumped here and um, so yeah. what let me let me put it in a simple way I, i'll try to explain it in a simple way okay mm -hmm. and this is for me from an, yeah. a live experience here and this is i think a compliment here you know icsb yeah. for years for years yeah. i can say almost 12 13 years icsb yeah. was well represented in the united states in europe yeah. and yeah. In, in asia and latin america but africa mm -hmm. was always a question mark for us Okay. Okay. We just yeah. didn't know. We didn't know how to approach Africa. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh. And since since March 12, I remember that day, March 12, when ICSB yeah. decided to double, triple, quadruple down on digital. Okay. Yeah. Where I yeah. made the decision, said every day we're going to have a webinar. Every two days we're going to have yeah. a webinar. We're gonna we're gonna blanket yeah. the webinars around the world. 
the yeah. leading participants, the leading yeah. participants of ICSB webinars are from Africa, yeah. are from Africa. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and the ICSB board are shocked. They're like, like what happened? And, and what yeah. my explanation is digital is what happened. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right? D yeah. You know, digital is what happened. Look, you're leading a, you're leading a webinar for us, right? That we could yeah. never even imagine a year ago, six months ago. Yeah. So yeah. It, 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 it's, this is the issue here. Yeah. Where do we, where is this going? Because this is exciting at the same time. Are we, are we, are we seeing something that nobody else sees? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. And I'll try my best to see if I can answer this question. Um, you know, I, I'll start by giving you an example. Like I said earlier, um, if you look at the statistics of motorization, Africa have the lowest uh, in, in, in the world, w with 100 million sold globally and only 1 million new cars sold in Africa. But also another way of looking at it is to say that, you know, from the statistics, I think some statistics suggest that nearly 90% are cars that are not new. Okay. But now what is happening is that while even in more developed countries yeah. using electric cars, solar electric cars, for example, you'll be surprised that I read that in Ghana, now you can actually hire a sedan electric car for $160 for a month, you know? Th that is amazing to think about. Like, I, I live here in the United Kingdom, but I don't see this often, like to see electric cars, you know, run all around me. Now, it is important because what is happening is that, like you said, Africa is jumping the curve and this is becoming a, a kind of a trend or a capability. I don't know what it is, but what is important to know is that Africa has a young population that are brand conscious and therefore digital savvy or trendy, if you like. So therefore, you know, what we would see in the future is that all these new technologies that are coming, they are more likely to embrace it. And in jumping that curb or leaf frog in or the, the digital leaf frog, you know, they jump all the traditional. So, so we're going to see a lot more of that. But I think w the main point I keep saying is that this is not just about Africa or other developed countries, it's about us all, you know, because the Africa does not have sufficient infrastructure in terms of research, technology, and, and this has a long way to go. But it's also well established in this part of the world. But because when these technologies are implemented there, what you learn, this, that's why it's called doing using interactive. That's called doing mode of innovation. That kind of innovation can only be learned in the environment in which it has been applied. And if it has no way of communicating back to science and technology centers, then somewhat, somewhat it could be lost uh, in chain you know, of, of events. And this is where I think like in the future, conscious, there needs to be a clear purposive agenda on how best the world could benefit from this. It's not the case like every time a new technology come and then Africa will just jump and then we say, oh yeah, it's actually helping, you know, resolving um, marginalized community in the rural centers. Now the, the farmers can use, you know, mobile and all that. It's much more than that. And I think one last thing is just to say that um, also, I mentioned this in many spaces, Africa had been passive recipient of many things in the past, but that must change. Africa must take, responsibility of co-created leadership, because if these technologies are being applied, you know, then Africa must stand up and actually co-create the new knowledge that is being generated in the African environment. So when is, when do we yes, send? Yes, so uh, that's my you, attempt to answer that. Yeah. No, no, this is good, but he raised this point. When do we send? I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but he said this, as you stated, spaces are critical. But in most African countries, there is still lots of technical gaps and lack of mm. infrastructure to make things by itself. So still Africa is struggling to yes. cope up. 
You know, but let me answer. Let me ask. Let me answer this yeah. a little bit here. Good question. Um, yeah. I have okay. two kids. I have two kids yeah. that are ten year old. Yeah. Right. So they went virtual um, last yeah. week. Okay. Yeah. The whole system, the online yeah. learning system in our county, yes. which is right yeah. outside Washington D.C., which is a high affluent, very technically yeah. capable. Right. It didn't work. It didn't work. The yes. system crashed. Yeah. And then, uh, more importantly, okay. the Washington Post reported that millions and millions of people yeah. in the United States, students, yeah. young kids, do yeah. not have um, bandwidth capability to learn online. So this is not just an Africa problem. This is a global problem because okay. even in the United States, we're having issues with online learning, yeah. which is digital learning. What's your reaction? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I mean, I couldn't say it better than you said, you know, globally, we're just learning, like, you know, people calling it the new normal, because this is something completely, um, you know, uncharted terrain for all. And like I said, it all points to the fact that I think the digital foresight research needs to be taken more seriously, you know, because no one ever thought about this gonna happen. So, but I, 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 I say like, um, I forgot his name, um, the person that, that they asked the question, he, you know, the lack of infrastructure uh, in Africa, I, I agree totally, but like I said, you know, complementary technologies that enable a space or environment to, to jump. For example, you know, I was reading the World Bank report, I forgot the figures like how much Africa needs to invest in developing the traditional infrastructure and also maintenance. It's almost impossible for Africa to reach anywhere. So talking about, you know, what, what we're talking about. So it meant that if there is some imagined new technology that enabled them to jump like ro ro robotics, flying robots or drones or, or whatever, then of course that, that should be encouraged. So, um, but I think uh, th there is no one magic bullet or one answer to this. We are still all learning, you know, in all of um, this process. But I think the issue I mentioned on the the space, I, I've seen like giants like Facebook have invested massively and invested massively in Africa. Um, infrastructure like fiber and, and things like that, that is going to help. But I think investing more in the space tech is likely going to be, you know, in the future. Okay. So I have, I have a question, but it's also a concern. Okay. And, um, okay. Yeah. And, and, um, and I'll raise it because this is a big problem that I know of that we're an ICSB. We're talking a lot about how to do. There is not just a digital divide in yeah. terms of technology there is also a gender divide yeah okay yeah. men and women do not get the same opportunity yes and i mm. and this is very clear i, I have it's a true. colleague from the un she talks about the, the yeah. moonshot the women moonshot in terms of giving women access to finances to capital to resources yeah. are we, yeah. what can we do to help from you know that's true i need an equivalent of you yeah. as a woman yeah I need, I need a woman like, I need an equivalent of you okay. as a woman. What do we do in terms of Africa and yeah, women I and technology? It. Where do we go with this? Uh, very, very good question. It's something that concerns me as well. And I remember in one of the discussions I had with you offline, uh, you mentioned that, you know, we need to give this very serious attention you know, the, the issue of gender and also youth generally. So I, I think um, it is very important to provide equal opportunities for all. Seems like what is happening is that most organizations will just sign to, you know, a charter or a treaty of equality and, you know, but th there needs to be more than that. For example, what I do mean is that because we're talking about digital, you know, the, the very, the fact that the, 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 we are going to be using a lot of technologies, you know, in, in the future to be deciding, 
for example, the enforcement of loans, you know, and equal opportunities, one would think like, if for example, you would go to a bank and not to be able to meet uh, a male biased person and then applied for your loan without taking away that, that, that interface, the chances are that you, you will have equal opportunities. But there is another big concern. A, a colleague of mine, uh, Skrania, uh, in Bournemouth University is doing some interesting research about women um, tech and entrepreneurship generally. And she told me that, you know, it's a big concern now, the sality experts in AI know this, and this is now continuously to be an issue. Like who is behind design or developing the artificial intelligence also have some sort of influence to it of some sort, uh, if you like. So it is likely the technology that we think we are bringing in artificial intelligence to fight inequality could also be biased. So she was saying that she read a research somewhere which also shows that the, the, the artificially intelligent tools used for, for this loan disbursements as kind of experimentation seems to be biased towards men. And so this is a very big fundamental issue. So the way to go about this is that we really, I said this last time, there are some uncomfortable truths that we keep shying away from. But if there is a discrimination of any form, you must include the persons who felt marginalized of some sort in the process of this construction. So the industry as a whole, you know, is dominated, you know, the digital is dominated by male, you know, and therefore the chances are that they will be the ones designing the programs that will dictate these inequalities that we want to fight. So I think without, you know, in, without kind of integrating and kind of including inclusive tech is the word, you know, inclusiveness of the technology and its creation is really crucial because humans are just naturally biased. Sometimes it's unconscious bias. They don't even know that they're doing it, but somehow they created a code, you know, which has been made in artificial intelligence that decides somebody's fate. So this is what I think about this. Absolutely, and, and I think you raise a, a good point here. Um, I know um, in, in the past, I think it was, I'm not sure of the exact details here, but, um, but um, and I might be incorrect here, but uh, Apple, the Apple credit card, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Was, was basically deciding on how much credit to give money credit, basically how much purchasing power you may have Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. For right, and it was one of the founders of Apple that yeah. had X amount of money available for him for credit, while his wife yeah. had had less, even though they had the yeah. same joint account, they had the same so bank account, that. right? And yeah. why? I, and, and and it was a big issue in the news, saying, is there a gender yeah. bias in 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 the way the formulas are calculated in terms of how yeah. much credit you can get? Now that yeah. that surprised me here, and I never knew what the answer is at the end. But just yeah. the mere question is when somebody's writing code and the question is, are you male or female, dictates yeah. how much credit you can get. Now, in reality, yeah. we know this happens, but yeah. when it's supposed to be blind based on a formula and yet there's yeah. inside the formula a bias, that yeah. creates a concern. Yeah, and, and actually just to complement your point, you, you know, uh, recently in the United Kingdom, you know, um, students, you know, because of the lockdown couldn't write exams and so they have had to create um, a system kind of with, with, with program that, that decides, you know, because initially it was the, the tutors that decides um, kind of the, the outcome of the students' grades, but then it was replaced by machine kind of system, which uses the data, which I don't have access to, I don't know the details, but there was huge uh, backlash here in the United Kingdom so much so that that had to be dropped and now we went back to the initial judgments that was passed on by the, um, the, 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 the tutors because they knew the students and they said this is the expected grade you know for the student and then suddenly we're using some machine which actually takes into consideration a kind of 
um, data about somebody's background and, and all that. I didn't know the details about the, the, the data that was imputed into the machine, but it created a big had to be re retracted. So I think that this is interesting, but inclusivity is, is quite very useful to make sure we include everyone. Okay, so um, we're, we're gonna stop here now, but let's take away maybe what is one or two major thinking points or points you want us to consider as we move forward and as we build to the next one. What might that be? A question, a comment? A question is, do not be limited by space. Space is what you make of it. And look around you in the space, either it is in the planet, Earth, in the sky, everywhere, and know that the space is just continuous, you know, and pick up a, pick a problem in your community, in your local community, in the world about poverty, about hunger, about health, about good education, gender equality, you know, all the things that you think matters, food security, climate change, biodiversity, pick one. As a digital entrepreneur, I can guarantee you the future, the future, you know, uh, consumers are more conscious than it had ever been. And we are getting to that space where, you know, the digital solution must be accompanied by some sort of you know, some conscious meaning behind it, deeper than the solution or, or the product that you're selling. And this would be, I think, the main thing that people should take away from this. This, is, this has been an excellent webinar. I want to thank you, um, Dr. Nasru, and everybody attending here. I know this is a series, so um, and we soon will post your first article as we continue this series here. For everybody else, Ojong and everybody else here, I want to thank you all for joining today. You have been absolutely fantastic. And um, please stay safe and, and then we'll be in touch. Dr. Nasru, thank you again. And uh, I also just want to say, um, I just want to say hello to everyone. And, um, you know, I wish you, you know, separate to where you are or you're going. And it was fascinating to see the number of people in attendance. And I enjoyed this and I wish you all the very best. Bye. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.